Good evening, good evening, good evening. How are we this evening? I'll just wait for a couple of people to come. Miston, how are you? Jez D, how are you? Masalso, Milk, Shami. Right guys, today I want to talk about a very important and critical issue. The issue about sanctions. To me this issue is so important and there's so much ignorance about this issue in Zimbabwe that we have to make this issue a public awareness issue. Now, when I made a video about Morgan Tsangirai and I was explaining about how Morgan was involved in those sanctions, a lot of people told me that I was lying. A lot of people said there were no sanctions in Zimbabwe. So what I would like to do today is something that I do not usually do, something that I never request, but I'm going to request it now. If you're watching, I say please share this video now. Share it because we need as many people, those people that say there are no sanctions in Zimbabwe, those people that say we are lying about Zimbabwe, I would like them to come and be a part and parcel of this. You never hear me asking you to share any of my videos, but right now I'm saying share the video. And unlike my usual videos where I make a quick video, I speak to people and I'm done. Today I'm actually going to be responding to people. I'm actually going to be taking calls from people so that we talk about this issue of sanctions and demystify it. I am doing this for a specific reason. As Africans, the one thing that has always happened to us is that the same tricks are used again and again to, subject, to subjugate us, to oppress us. And some of those things that are used to subjugate us are tactics like these. Tactics like these um, sanctions that we continue to think don't exist and we blame our governments for them. Yet in reality, sanctions have existed in Zimbabwe and they are part and parcel of why you are suffering today. They are part and parcel of why people in Zimbabwe are dying in Zimbabwe today. They are part and parcel of why your relatives are in a lot of trouble today. The reason I'm making this video is to demystify all this, to make it clear to you how it is that Zimbabwe is being affected and why Zimbabwe is being affected. It is important that we share so that those that say I'm a liar, those that say I don't know what I'm talking about, can come and be part and parcel of the conversation and explain how it is that I am lying. It is important that we have this discussion because it hasn't been had before. And the reason why you see very few people making videos about this, very few of our false media, our, 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 our fake media making these videos, is that they usually don't even know about these sanctions. And the few that know about these sanctions, the few that understand about these sanctions, get their mileage by vilifying ZANOPF. They build their audience by vilifying ZANOPF. Some of the people are politicians who don't want this issue to come out because the moment it is said that there is sanctions, then of course there's nothing to talk about. We have to support our country because of the war that is being imposed on it. We must understand that sanctions are a means of war. Sanctions are a type of war that is instituted on a country. The United States will take nations to war because those nations refuse to trade oil, their own oil. Nations that refuse to trade their own oil in US dollars are attacked by the United States because if oil is not sold in US dollars, the United States economy will fall. However, the issue is that right now, Sanctions are on your country. It has been removed from the financial institutions of the world and the banking system of the world. And Zimbabwe is supposed to progress 
but the United States would never tolerate if you sold your oil in any other currency than the US dollar. I'll read one or two comments. Shami, you are right. There's some, uh, Shami says that you are right, uh, but the way you went about it was wrong, because how can you say that you will piss on someone's grave? How about the family that he left behind? Do you th how do you think they'll feel about this? Shami was very clear in my video that the Changirai family has never had respect for Zimbabwe. They've never had respect for Zimbabwe in that when their father started creating MDC so that Zimbabweans, normal Zimbabweans would not get land, they never complained about it. They never told their father not to form a political party that was going to stop ordinary Zimbabweans from getting their land. You also must accept that when he did form that party in order to stop the ordinary Zimbabwean from getting land, the father was getting paid by foreign agencies to sabotage his country and to sabotage the common person in Zimbabwe. When the father was part of the people that architected the sanctions in Zimbabwe, he and the family did not have a problem with sabotaging Zimbabwe and destroying the lives of millions of Zimbabweans with sanctions. So I don't respect the family. And like I said then, they don't deserve the respect because they never respected Zimbabweans. If you can't see that, I struggle to find out how you can have a problem with what it is that I'm saying. So now, let's go into this sanctions issue. What are the sanctions in Zimbabwe about? The Zimbabwean sanctions are called, there is a legal name for them. There is a name that was given by the United States Congress that instituted those sanctions. Those sanctions were instituted by the United States Congress as law, and that law is called the Zidera Act of 2001. What was that Zidera Act all about? What was it meant to do? Now, in the statement that was given by the United States Congress, in the institution of those very same sanctions, this is what they said. They said that the policy statement of the Act is that it is to motivate, sorry, it is to, the, the policy statement from the United States says the following. It is the policy of the United States government to help the people of Zimbabwe effect peaceful democratic change. Number two, to achieve broad-based economic growth. Number three, to restore the rule of law in Zimbabwe. Now, you need to understand that the Zimbabwean government has always been saying that the United States government instituted the sanctions for regime change. And in the very first statement that is given in the U.S. policy statement is that to help Zimbabwean people effect peaceful democratic change. The question is, who had told the United States that Zimbabwe needed democratic change? Why did the United States feel the need to help Zimbabwe to effect democratic change? And what does it mean when the policy statement of a foreign nation says that it wants to help another nation to achieve democratic change? Then they go and they, they talk about the reasons or the motivation for the sanctions. And they say that the reason why they were going to institute sanctions are the following. Now I'm going to give you context before I read what it is that they said. When Zimbabwe said it wanted to take its land in 1997, and they said that they were going to take this land without compensation because the British government had refused to give the money that it promised in the Lancaster House Conference to pay for white farmers' loss of, loss of land. The international community approached Zimbabwe and said to Zimbabwe, let's have a conference, a land donor conference, where we are going to discuss this issue about Zimbabwe needing to take land. Let's sit down have a discussion, have a negotiation, see where Britain and Zimbabwe are not in agreement, and once we have ascertained what the problem is, we negotiate a new way forward 
for us to be able to have this land taken and farmers compensated. The United Kingdom was standing on the premise that it believed that the amount of money that was being paid by the Zimbabwean government for land was not enough. The United Kingdom was also saying that it can only give a certain portion of that money because the money that had been set aside by Margaret Thatcher had run out and the new government that had come in did not have a budget for land reform or to pay farmers for compensation so Zimbabwe would have to take loans so that it can be able to pay white farmers. Robert Mugabe clearly then told the committee that was sitting, the people that were sitting and the donors that were sitting, that the land reform program is not negotiable. The return of Zimbabwean land is the reason why Zimbabwe had gone to war. The return of Zimbabwean land was unequivocal because colonization was a crime and so Zimbabweans were supposed to get their land and Zimbabwe would not compensate farmers for land that they had stolen in the first place unless the United Kingdom, as it had agreed in 1980, would give its sons and daughters the compensation. Mugabe was clear that the donors in the United Kingdom were not doing a favor to Zimbabwe by giving money that was going to be paid to white farmers. Because as Mugabe put it, he was willing to take land without compensation because it belonged to Zimbabweans in the first place. He did not mind if white farmers were not compensated if their mother country was not interested in ensuring that they were compensated. And he was not going to negotiate new terms and conditions because Lancaster House Conference and its agreement were already sealed in stone. What Mugabe was saying is that if you expect me to honor my international agreements, if you expect me to honor all the agreements, including paying the debt that Ian Smith left, including the debt that was accrued by Ian Smith and Rhodesia in order to fight our ancestors, if you expect me to keep that end of my bargain, then you as England must keep your end of the bargain which is to pay your sons and daughters and not expect my people who were oppressed to pay the compensation on your behalf. Mugabe was clear at the conference that you are not doing us a favor. The land is ours. We don't need to earn our land. We already fought for it and we won it. We are not going to renegotiate a 17-year-old agreement today because the British don't want to meet up with their end of the bargain. In this conference, obviously, they never got to an understanding. As usual, the conference members started saying that the money that you've been given, you're using it corruptly. But already you need to understand that 3.5 million hectares had already been bought by the Zimbabwean government from, two, from 1980 to, 2000 and, uh, to 1997 when these discussions were being had. Those 3.5 million hectares had already been given out to at least 150,000 families. And the question that Mugabe was saying is, how can you say we are being corrupt? You gave us 45 million pounds to buy 3.5 million hectares. We bought those. Where else could we have bought land at a cheaper price than that? And by this time, Mugabe had earmarked another 5,000 hectares that he was going to take of the 11 million hectares that white farmers had. So at the end of this, at the end of the land program, Mugabe had planned that they would have taken 8.5 million hectares of land. Obviously, they never got into an agreement at this conference, at the land donor conference. And so when they did not get to an agreement, the IMF and all the other multilateral finance institutions, the World Bank and the International Development Bank, then decided to cut off Zimbabwe's debt. They decided to suspend Zimbabwe from those particular institutions. In the background, if you remember, MDC was already getting formed. MDC was already getting formed for the purpose that 
if Mugabe is not persuaded not to take land without compensation at the land donor conference, MDC would be able to rise, and with Zimbabwe being taken off from the IMF, with Zimbabwe still suffering from the effects of ESAP, it would be easy for an opposition party to take over the country because the government of Zimbabwe, without loans from the IMF, without the cancellation of debt from these multilateral financial institutions, would, be, would not be able to function. So MDC had already started getting formed. It was already being planned. It was already in the plans. It was already in the pipelines, specifically as a countermeasure if Mugabe continued to insist that he was going to take land after the 1998 land donor conference. And so when Mugabe refused the plans to form MDC with the meeting that they had in Mutari continued in earnest. And this is after the protests that had been happening with the Zimbabwe trade union that was getting Zimbabweans to support the trade union. It was now being asked for that very same trade union to convert itself into a political party that had a lot of support of the workers to be able to overthrow the ZANU-PF government. And the elections were supposed to happen in 2000, so this was happening in less than a two-year period. They were going to create a political party. After creating that political party, that political party was going to campaign and campaign enough to be able to overthrow ZANU-PF when the elections came in 2000. Not only that, this very same group of people was going to create a lobby against the ZANU-PF government that was trying to change the constitution. So to be able to change the constitution, they needed a referendum. And MDC was also going to strategically position itself to stop that referendum from succeeding so that ZANU-PF would not be able to change the law. And the specific law that they needed to change was the clause of the Appropriation of Land Act, or the, 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 the what you call it, the um, uh, Acquisition of Land Act. They needed to be to be able to save the land without compensation. Campaigning against the referendum. One, the referendum did not pass. Zano PF did not get the right to change the constitution because the MDC and all the other civil society groups went out and said that the change to the constitution is about Mugabe getting more powers. It is about Mugabe staying in power and him extending his term of power and him getting more executive powers that are going to make it difficult for us as other opposition parties to contest. Nowhere in what the MDC was talking about did they mention the issue of land and the fact that they wanted this referendum to fail so that some people would not be able to take power. In that referendum, people believed that this was about stopping Mugabe from being a tyrant. People believed that this was about stopping this greedy Mugabe from remaining in power. And so after that, they immediately went a few months later into the elections, hoping that the same way the MDC had defeated ZANU-PF or the government for referendum, they felt that they were going to win power. They were able to contest in all 120 provinces, I mean constituencies, that ZANU-PF was in all the constituencies that were on the ballot paper. At the end of those elections, they got 57 seats, and ZANU-PF won narrowly with 61. A lot of people then say that there was political violence, this is why MDC did not win, but the question is, if there was political violence, why did that political violence not help to stop MDC from stopping the referendum from being won by the government? How did they even get 57 seats? if it wasn't free and fair? How were they able to contest and be able to go to all 
120 constituencies and contest if there was violence. There are articles that say 41 people died in the process of these elections. Both MDC and ZANOPF, I would assume that there's more MDC casualties. But in Kenya, 600 people died. In South Africa, right now, as I speak to you, 92 politicians, not supporters, 92 politicians have died within a three-year period. How come sanctions have not been imposed? on Kenya and South Africa. So after MGC lost, and they lost after the IMF had removed its money from Zimbabwe, they lost after ZANU-PF had already started struggling to keep Zimbabwe going, they lost those elections. The panacea for land not to be taken, which was the MDC, had failed to deliver on the mandate that they had promised the international community. And not only that, ZANU-PF had gone to change the constitution anyway with their majority in parliament. And so, MDC and the United States began to negotiate about the creation of sanctions that after the IMF had refused Zimbabwe loads after the United States they have the power to make Financial mismanagement for Zimbabwe's participation in the Congo War has made Zimbabwe ineligible to be part of multilateral lending institutions like the World Bank, like the International Bank of Reconstruction and Development, the IMF, which would otherwise be taking part in the development and modernization of the Zimbabwean economy. The people of Zimbabwe have thus been denied the economic and democratic benefits envisaged by the donors of such a program. The findings go to build the context of how the 2002 and these sanctions got to happen. These findings that Zimbabwe had participated in Congo and mismanaged its finances by participating in Congo is one of the major reasons why the Desidera sanctions were created. But why is Congo important? Congo is important because at this time, Congo had just come out of what we call Congo War I. In Congo War I, we had the removal of Mabutu Seseseko. After Mabutu Seseseko was removed, Laurent Kabila, who had removed him, went into power. But remember, Mabutu Seseko was a puppet of the United States and Western governments. He allowed them to come into the country and pillage the uranium and pillage the resources of Congo. And that is the reason he was overthrown by Laurent Kabila. When Laurent Kabila comes into power, the United States and the Europeans think that Laurent Kabila is going to be able to give them all the things that they were being given by Mabutu. He th they thought that they, he was going to be able to allow them to continue to pillage the Congolese, but Laurent Kabila refused. And he was backed up by Rwandese rebels and those from Uganda. These rebels here were being financed by the United States and the Europeans. The reason they were being financed is to cause destabilization in Congo and allow the continuous pillage of Congolese resources without an organized government. When Kabila got into power, he was supposed to have gone and give general positions and military positions to the Ugandans and the Rwandans, but Kabila refused. When he refused, he immediately got instructions from Rwanda and Kampala to overthrow Kabila. When Kabila was about to be overthrown, 
He made a phone call to Robert Mugabe and all other Sadak members that he needed help from other Sadak countries because of a protocol that they called the organ that they had created to go to the rescue of any other African nation that gets attacked by, other, by, 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 by any other nation from outside. When Kabila asked Sadak, some Sadak countries, like the South Africans, the Zambians, the Botswanans, who are influenced a lot by imperialists, refused to join because they had been told not to take part. Then who was left now were countries like Zimbabwe, uh, Namibia, and Angola. They decided to go and help Lauren Kabila. Zimbabwe and those three nations, together with Libya from the north, and Chad went in to help Lauren Kabila. So they frustrated the efforts of the imperialists to remove Lauren Kabila. Because of that frustration, Zimbabwe was put on sanctions. But that was just one problem that they had caused. The biggest problem was taking the land of white Rhodesian. And so the United States then say in the creation and the framing of their sanctions, as part of the Zidera sanctions, the, Zimbab the, the United States government said support for democratic transition and economic recovery. This is how they headed and motivated sanctions in Zimbabwe. And it says the United States directs its executive director to vote against any restructuring, cancellation, reduction, or extension of the debt to Zimbabwe until the following conditions are met. Rule of law, including the respect of ownership of property, respect of freedom of speech, freedom of association, and the end of lawlessness, violence, intimidation, sponsored by the government and the ruling party and its supporters. The government has held free and fair presidential elections. Now remember, presidential elections were coming in 2003. So the government has held free and fair presidential elections that are observed and accepted by independent observers. And the pre-electoral conditions are to be sta a standard accepted to the international uh, standards of freedom of movement. And then a commitment of the land reform done in a transparent and orderly manner that is in line with the agreement of the Land Reform and Resettlement Conference in Harare in 1998. Give me two seconds, I need to just do something. So, those were the conditions now that were laid down for the creation of these sanctions and the foundation of the sanctions had been created. And the foundation of the sanctions was simply that the United States government was going to support the IMF and the international multilateral, multilateral lending institutions in not giving Zimbabwe debt. But not only that, they were also going to support that these institutions should not cancel any debt to Zimbabwe and they shall can cancel any budgets that have been put aside for the development of Zimbabwe. So already there were contracts that had been made between Zimbabwe and these multilateral lending institutions for the development of projects. And this is where projects like the Zambezi Water Project were going to be getting funds from there and many other projects that had to be shelved because the IMF and these international institutions were not going to give Zimbabwe money. And the reasons for not giving Zimbabwe money were given here. The rule of law and freedom of speech. But this is where the crux comes. Where had they gotten the impression that there was no rule of law in Zimbabwe? Because there were elections that had taken place in 2000 in which the MDC did very well in those particular elections. Not only did the MDC do very well, but when you read the Commonwealth report on those particular elections, they say that those elections were a, an advancement of democracy in Zimbabwe 
and there had been no other elections prior to the 2000 elections that had brought in democracy to the extent that these elections had brought in. They also admitted that MDC had performed better than any other political party had ever performed in an election in Zimbabwe since 1980. Now, I would even go to the extent that the elections that were held in 2000 were not the best since 1980. They were the best ever since the European political system came into Zimbabwe a hundred years before. And then they go and say that there is no freedom of speech, no freedom of association. But if you remember MDC and the civil society organizations that campaigned for people not to vote for the referendum, they were very vocal. They were able to have meetings. I remember leaving South Africa, going all the way for a meeting that was at the Monon Tapa, and there was no one being stopped from speaking, no one was being stopped from promoting the agenda of voting against the referendum. In the same way, I also saw MDC campaigning freely in Zimbabwe. So it begins to become clear that they feel that MDC was not given a platform to campaign, yet they still went on to win 57 seats. Because if you're not being allowed to campaign, people don't know about you. MDC was a new party, so how is it that people in the villages and people in 120 constituencies were able to know about MDC so significantly that the MDC was able to get 57 seats out of the 120 that were on offer? How did people know about MDC? How did they know where to put their X if people did not have freedom of speech, freedom of association? Then there's an issue about talking about how there should be international monitors. I just told you now that there is a report by the Commonwealth. Now the Commonwealth is not African countries. The Commonwealth is all countries that were previously colonized by the United Kingdom. They wrote a report because they were actually election observers in that particular election. The only election, other people who were not there are the Europeans and the Americans. And the reasons were that they were seen as they were being part and parcel of the people that were influencing the electoral process in favor for MDC. So they were not neutral. And if we remember, right now we just had the Kenyan elections. The American election observers, the European election observers, all said that those elections were free and fair. But yet the Supreme Court of Kenya said that those very same elections were not free and fair. So the question is, are American observers and are European observers the only international observers? Do we count out the Commonwealth observers that said that those elections in 2000 in Zimbabwe were as close to free and fair as possible and they had advanced democracy in Zimbabwe? And if it means that the Europeans were not there but their counterparts who happened to be the Commonwealth said that the elections were good, if Sadek said the elections were good, where did the United States get the motive or the motivation or stimuli to say that there were no free and fair elections and these elections were unfair in a country where MDC, a, country, a, a party that was less than two years old, had won 57 seats. So then we come to the last point, which is now the issue of the fact that there needs to be property rights in Zimbabwe. I believe that that is the crux of the issue. The issue of land reform did not sit well with the Americans. And that is actually the point that caused them to put the sanctions. But the question is, whose land rights were they talking about? Because Zimbabweans had been dispossessed of their land for a hundred years. No one had ever put the sanctions on the British for taking Zimbabwean land. And so now that the Zimbabweans were taking back their land, which the British, British failed to pay for, why was that now a situation seen as if there's no respect for property rights? It was obviously the issue that the property must belong to white people for there to be property rights in the country. And so these are the sanctions that people have always been ignoring. The sanctions that people keep saying never existed in Zimbabwe. The sanctions that they keep saying they never were any sanctions in Zimbabwe, but the sanctions that were in Zimbabwe were targeted sanctions and targeted at corrupt politicians, corrupt ZANU-PF politicians. But is that true? Is it true that the sanctions that were put were targeted at politicians? Because when a nation is removed from the financial system of the world, when it is removed from the banking system of the world, 
and I think you heard Mangunjiga talking the other day that Zimbabwe has decoupled or has been left by 108 banks internationally. How did that happen? Recently you saw the CBZ being fined a bill, 3 billion US dollars by the British, by the American government for undertaking transactions with companies or institutions that are under sanctions. But I thought we said that there are no sanctions in Zimbabwe. I thought we said that the sanctions in Zimbabwe are targeted at individuals. So why are we hearing the CBZ being penalized by the British uh, American government for having or holding transactions with companies that are on the sanctions list? I know a friend of mine here on Facebook who's got a company that is in the jewelry industry that is under sanctions. And it is under sanctions because of a member of the previous government who went and reported him as being doing business with the Zimbabwean government. So he was put under sanctions. So any company that does business with the Zimbabwean government can be put under sanctions. To hold transactions in Zimbabwe as a private company, when your transaction is being processed by the switching or the switch agencies or the switch institutions, your transaction will take sometimes up to four or five weeks, yet with all other people it takes anything between three days and seven days. Those are sanctions. There are people within Zimbabwe who cannot transact with their companies when they're selling goods and services to the international community because of the sanctions that are on Zimbabwe that people say don't exist. Now what tells you that MDC was complicit in these sanctions is that they have never told you what I'm telling you now. You have never heard MDC telling you that there's something called Zidera 2001 S41, S494. Why? Instead, they told you that there is sanctions that are targeted at ministers. If you look at the Zidera document, the Zidera Act doesn't mention a single minister's name. The Zidera Act and the Zidera sanctions do not mention any targeted sanctions on individuals. They talk about how the banning of Zimbabwe from the multilateral institutions of the world, the banning of Zimbabwe from the banking institutions of the world shall be ratified by the Americans who shall use their directors to ensure that Zimbabwe cannot get debt relief, Zimbabwe cannot get debt, and Zimbabwe cannot be able to undertake any negotiations for debt with those particular institutions. So now, why didn't MDC tell us? As a political party that is interested in the lives of its citizens, why did they not tell us that our country could no longer get debt? Our country could no longer get debt for those programs that are already in the pipeline and have been agreed, the, the developments that were supposed to happen in the nation. And as you saw, they said that the people of Zimbabwe have thus, it says clearly here that the people of Zimbabwe have thus been denied the opportunity for development. What did they mean by that? And why did MDC not know about this? And why is it that MDC has been campaigning for the maintenance of those very same sanctions ever since 2001? And until recently, three months ago, they went all the way to America to ask for the maintenance of those particular sanctions. But they say that there are no sanctions on Zimbabwe. So why are they lying if they are not involved in these sanctions? Why are they lying if they are not part and parcel of the people who created these sanctions? And why have they been supporting the maintenance of these particular sanctions if they felt that they didn't exist? When they went three months ago to ask for these sanctions to continue, what were they asking for, yet they said that there are no sanctions? What were they asking to continue? And if the MDC continues to campaign for the maintenance of these sanctions so that they can keep Zimbabwe down. Is Zimbabwe being killed because of corruption? Is Zimbabwe being killed because of lack of free and fair elections? Is Zimbabwe being destroyed because the politicians are corrupt? Or is Zimbabwe being destroyed by these sanctions that were designed to ensure that the, Z the Zanopiev government fails so that MDC can ascend into power? Because the Zidera document itself is clear that it is about bringing democratic change.
Now, whenever you have a country that wants to maintain democracy in a nation, democracy does not always amount to change because citizens of a nation might be happy with the sitting government. So when you say the democracy you're going to support is one that causes change, you are not looking at the needs, the intentions, or the will of the people in that nation, but you're looking at the will of changing to the person that you want. That is a regime change agenda. How did they know that the people of Zimbabwe didn't want ZANU-PF? What made them think that the people of Zimbabwe needed support for change? These are the questions that we need to ask based on what they wrote in their own document, not things that I'm making up. Now listen guys, I would like to speak to those that say that there are no sanctions. I have read for you what the document says. I have given you a synopsis of what the sanctions are about. They are about the removal of Zimbabwe from the banking system of the world. They are about the removal of Zimbabwe from the lending institutions of the world to ensure that Zimbabwe cannot borrow money from those institutions, to ensure that Zimbabwe cannot undertake any, any infrastructure developments based on debts that come from these multilateral institutions, and to also ensure that all the debts that Zimbabwe had at that particular time would immediately be recalled by those institutions. So if anybody wants to talk about this issue, please ask me to invite you or add you, and I will add you so that I can hear what it is that you've got to say you can explain to me how it is that you feel that Zimbabwe is not under sanctions and that these sanctions do not affect the well-being of Zimbabwe. Now, I need to, to put into context what it is that being under sanctions means. Being under sanctions is like being told that you cannot go to work. You are barred from going to work. You are barred from going to the company that you work at, and you're also barred from applying for any calls, Daniel. Kuda, I'm trying to, I'm trying to invite you. Can you, can you make sure that your thing is landscape, my guy? I'm trying to invite you there. So is your, is your device landscape? Because mine is landscape, so that we can. So just check if your, if your device is, 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 is landscape, Kuda. I really want to speak to you, and I really want you to come on. So just check if your device is landscape, Kuda. So, <clears throat> Kuda. Hi. God says. Hey, it's Kuda. Chef Bay, not Kuda, unfortunately. Hello. Kuda. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi. How Hi. Yes. I unfortunately, it's not him. It's me. <laughs> My phone has no battery, so I was watching you on his channel. Okay. Okay. See you. So, yeah, you can see me. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. So, I just want to engage on. I can hear you. On. I really need uh, Kuda Mama Kuda to come back. I will try and call her back, uh, get her back again. I think it's an important, it's important that we, um, let me try again, let me try again. There we go. Let's try Kuda again. I really would love to hear what Kuda has to say because it is important that we have this discussion. Um, Chris Ba says, why is this the most hated man in I? I think I'm the most hated man because people hate truth. Zimbabweans struggle with truth. And remember, whenever we bring out the truth about things like sanctions, it sounds like we're endorsing the ZANU-PF government. If we say that sanctions are the reason why Zimbabwe is not doing well, it makes people feel as if we're saying ZANU-PF can do the job the only reason why ZANU-PF is not doing a good job is because of the sanctions, so therefore we are endorsing ZANU-PF. This is why people hate that message. I'm trying to invite Kuda. We seem to be struggling. I'm trying to add him. I hope he comes on now. So that's why people hate me, because I give that perspective that where mainstream media will not give you. I give you a historical context of imperialism. A lot of Zimbabweans are in love with their oppressor. 
So when you speak against the oppressor, when you speak about white people being evil or white people being uh, parasitic upon Africans, a lot of people don't want to hear that. A lot of people do not believe that. Kuda, I'm trying to invite you, my bro. Um, what is going on with your, what you call it? Let me try and invite you here. Uh, da, 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 da. Kuda, can you send that, please, please, can you send that request so that I can put you on? I'm struggling to get you on, my guy. Technology sabotaging me now. <laughs> wow. This always happens when I have a live and I want people to come on. I always then struggle to invite people on. So like now, could I? Right. Could I? I'm inviting you again, please. I have your device in the right direction. <laughs> all right i'm inviting kuda again i really want kuda to come on because i think we need to have this discussion kuda it says that i can't bring you on camera so I don't understand why that is. All right. Right, guys. My, let's wait and see, let's wait and see, let's wait and see, let's wait and see. My phone crashed and I know a lot of people think that, um, a lot of people think that I don't like taking questions or now it looks like I was dodging Kuda's question. But this is one of the reasons why I never take uh, lives or at least uh, I never add people because I struggle to put people onto my device to have a discussion so if Kuda is back I would like Kuda to come on so that we can have a conversation the topic that I was talking about if Kuda comes back please let me know the topic that I was talking about was the issue there we go Kuda let's try you now Kuda Let's see if you can come on, my nigga. Let's have this conversation. I think it's a very important. I was talking about the sanctions that have always Thank been you. denied. Kuda. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yes, how are you? Hi. I'm fine. So unfortunately, it's not Kuda engaging today. It's going to be me. I don't know if you want to engage later. Okay. Okay, no, no, no. so what maybe let, let me make concessions. Yeah, I'm going to make concessions because I'm a person of agreement and disagreement on specific things, right? So the facts that you read out are correct, right? You are not wrong, but your analysis is very extreme angled to a pro Zanu PF person or to a pro current government person, and which is fine because that's your choice of association. But let's address the fact when it was a political move that MDC needed to do. The United States and the UK institution, institutioning sanctions on Zimbabwe and the government was a plus for them to win a political move. It was never about whether the sanctions are good or bad or anyone knew the results thereafter. The only move that MDC did was to say, we are on board 
strictly because as soon as we win the election, which they were confident they would win, which they won, but they still didn't get, right? As soon as you win the election, you take down the sanctions because they are targeted at removing the government. It, it is war in essence. And in any war, you use your best allies to win war. So they had to fight people on the outside and they had to fight MDC on the inside. Unfortunately, MDC didn't win, but Zidera still stands because it's policy, it's foreign policy of the Americans. So you are right that foreign policy, foreign policy existed to go wrong on Zimbabwe, but then it was never, let, let's not make an assumption that MDC people made the intention to intentionally inflict pain on the Zimbabwean economy. It was never about that. It was supposed to be a political play that was supposed to win them the chess game, which anyone, even if ZANU-PF lost and MDC was in, then MDC wakes up one day and says, you know what, guys, actually, we still think that the Lancaster House Agreement, the same way that Nkomo and Robert Mugabe knew that the Lancaster House Agreement was full of shit and they still signed was because they knew that the moment they signed this, it institutes a certain um, domino effect, right? There's a political expediency that will happen as soon as they sign the Lancaster House Agreement, right? And when it went to now, shit, now Mugabe you, immediately wait. said, nah, you guys are now, then taking now. it the wrong way. And he went back on his word, right? So you are right that the the the... the the British government went back on its no. word. So he was fine to go back on his word. So let's not make the assumption that Zidera was done and was propagated by MDC solely because they wanted to inflict pain on the Zimbabwean economy. It was a political play that went wrong. And politics, a day in politics is a long day. So let me ask you a number. Yes. Let me ask you a number of questions. So Sorry, you've made, come again. You've yes. made some concessions. And the first concession that you make is that there were ele there were sanctions. The second concession that yeah. you make is that MDC took advantage of those very same sanctions. Now, what I need to know from you is the political it a foreign policy of the United States. This foreign, pol yes. this foreign policy of the United States is it legal? That's point number one. According to international law, well, is it the, the legality stands in yes. the international I say community. When you go and you look at the GATT okay. regulation. No, it doesn't. It's not legal. Just like colonization was not legal, slavery were not legal, but the international community accepted well, 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 again, the European like, accepted what you agreed. This is how they benefit from unfair and illegal acts. But let me take you to this. Is Which is essentially yeah. what every government does. The legality oh, of okay. anything is only legal okay. to those that okay. benefit. The, and the government that does not want the World Trade Organization. These to institutions to speak are out. Not just so, is it legal for you to hold people they against their freedom of association and 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 choice? Well, no, it's not. Is it? Let me finish. Okay, I'll let you. Okay, I think we have like a slight delay. You didn't give me an opportunity to finish what I was saying. Those I'm, I'm sorry, you can go on. Are what constitute the international institutions that create the laws by which the world lives. There, is, there are laws according to how the world must trade. There is no company, no country... There is no country in the world that is allowed to, 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 to exert hegemony or to control the trade or trade activities of any other nation, according to GATT and the World Trade Organization. This is not permissible. According to human rights and according to the rights of humanity, human beings are supposed to be able to trade and have freedom of ability to create wealth and that has been removed by the sanctions that were put by the United States, which when you look at the basis upon which they were put, they were not put according to the boundaries and parameters that have been set by international law and international trade organizations. So how do you then justify illegal okay. acts and hegemony, which is equivalent to colonization of another nation? I, 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 will, I will use, okay, can I answer? And then I need to really make my submissions very clear. So I might need you seven minutes. 
Can you hear me? That's all I usually take to make an argument. So I, for about seven minutes, I really need you not to interject so that we don't speak over each other. So just to answer your point of information that you just posed now, do you think IPA and POSA are in the sense that they infringe on the freedom of association and freedom of movement and freedom of choice and freedom of speech. They become illegal. The premise that you want to say sanctions are illegal is that it becomes illegal to those who are not benefiting at that stance. Anything that is made legal by a government that is benefiting stands. You have privilege of exercising certain things that you cannot be held accountable for. This we all know. But let's go back to the initial arguments that we were having. So the legality or the illegality of sanctions is based on who is benefiting and who is instituting. So to the Americans and to the world at large, those sanctions are very legal. But to the Zimbabweans, because you are suffering and you're not benefiting anything, they are very illegal. However, when MDC took a stance, it was a political stance that backfired on them. This does not mean, no, wait, this does not mean that the MDC made a move that intentionally wanted to harm its people of the Zimbabwean nation. So we cannot then go on and say, hold on, hold on. Like I said, seven minutes. What makes the seven sense? minutes? No, no, no. I don't want you That's to what I said. What you're saying, you've got to explain what I, you're I saying. did. You can't I... just what, what makes these what makes them legal? Give me the law that makes these things okay. legal. I'm using an analogy that I'm going to ask you again. Do you think the IPA and the POSA Act are legal? Do you think that they're legal? No, 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 no. That's not the issue that we're discussing now. You need to answer the question. It's an analogy. Answer, answer the question so that I drive you so to the point. So uh, do you think POSA and IPA are legal? The that you're talking about. See, this is, this is legal it? acts that actually run the nation currently. I'm asking so you, you do you think that IPA and POSA are that. legal? You can't, uh, you can't drive a I am not avoiding. It's called analogy to explain and give an argument clearly. You can't drive you can't drive a point by refusing to answer the question. is legal in the American quarters because it was made by the American government. It stands Which legal American in America. Court? That's why Americans refuse for certain but people to come onto legal? their grounds. It stays legal for them. It stays legal for them. Unfortunately, you don't want to engage on the analogy point because when you then address the fact that I'm giving you an example of a very illegal law that we have in our country that contravenes human rights, but you don't want to engage on that point because you feel it's going to take away from your argument. So let's just continue I'm and move on. So the data was just a plot. I can't engage with you. Don't the, 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 and if you want to speak alone, it makes it difficult for me to engage you. We're supposed to have... A That's what I'm saying. You are failing to... Speak. I ask a question. Can I ask I you a question and you, you answer clearly? Can I answer you the question now? Can I ask the question okay. now? Can I ask the question? Do you feel that the IPA and I, I, POSA laws of Zimbabwe I, I, are just, legal? You, you, what, I was trying to, what I was trying to put across to you and what you're failing to understand is that Zidane Zidera is not a domestic law. It is a law that has been created to have an international consequence on another Say nation. Not. That becomes international law. Whenever a law is made for other nations, that's international law. So I need you to make it clear how it is that a law passed in America becomes legal for the rest of the world and becomes legal and binding for a nation that has not accepted it and when a lot of other nations in the world don't accept it. It's like attack of Iraq. What? When the United States went to attack Iraq without a UN resolution, that was an illegal act. When right now, when the Israelis are occupying Palestine, okay. it is an illegal act because there are conventions, there are uh, resolutions that have been passed to say those are illegal activities. So what makes legal the sanctions against Zimbabwe? I asked you that question. What in the UN... Okay, let me answer you. International body let me answer you. The American let me answer you. Act in international law. Let me answer you. So you still have the body that oversees all these countries that makes international law, such as the UN, right? Saying or instituting that whatever that America is doing under the parts of protecting human lives becomes legal and gives a blind eye and a deaf ear to some of the illegal things that the US I'm is doing is because the United States belongs to the Security Council. You cannot hear me? 
No, okay. the Security so, Council does not pass wait. laws in the UN. It does not pass. It laws. doesn't it pass laws, laws, but then it gets it so gets the freeway. Make, so it gets the freeway of protecting human life, providing shelter, giving donor funding. That makes it overlook the fact that at war, which is instituted by an American government, can I, still be an illegal law. But then, because they are doing something to go in, they are going to be protected by the same laws that are trying to protect people. But again, my my questions and everything was never around the legality and illegality of of the sanctions. Go back. I'm okay. Hear what okay. He said mm -hmm. I should call him back. All right. Um, I did get a bit of what she's trying to say that um, because America sits on the Security Council, it means, therefore, that America has got the right to make any laws that it requires to make, and if the rest of the Security Council acknowledge and accept, then that becomes legal. It was never passed through the UN Security Council for sanctions to be put on Zimbabwe. It was a, a, a law that was made in the Senate of the United States government. Let me try and invite somebody else. Melk, I saw Melk just a moment ago. Give me two seconds to get somebody else. All right. Lloyd. So that is that is that is the issue that is affecting me is that she's saying that if you're a member of the Security Council and you can pass rules and you can pass laws as the Security Council, and this is a Security Council that was constituted in nineteen forty nine. This is a, 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 a Security Council that consists of colonial powers that still had colonies by the time that it was constituted. She is therefore saying that those countries that make colonial laws, those countries that used to hold colonies, those countries that are what we call imperial nations, sitting in a little council of six nations alone, constitutes legality at international law. Now, what I want to understand is which laws do they create in the Security Council alone? I'm going to try and uh, try somebody else because I can't seem to get Lloyd. I'm struggling with people here. Lloyd, I'll try you again. Please hold your device. Right, it says I can't bring you on. Lloyd, you need to hold your phone like this. Hold your phone properly, bruh, if you want me to be able to invite you. Um, who else wants to be invited? All right. Norma says she wants to be added. Let's see. Uh, da Sekuru Bob, let me try and invite Sekuru Bob. Guys, can you ask to be added so that I can add you guys? Because it's a lot of you guys, I'm trying to click your thingy and it's not accepting. Can you hold your phone in a in a in, a, in landscape so that I can be able to call you back? Bring back Norma. The problem, Mudiwa, is I can't hear what Norma is saying. So she's I'm struggling to hear what Norma is saying. I can't bring her back if her reception on the other side is not working properly. That is the problem. Uh, let's see. There. Let me try Noma again. I can't bring Kudamusa Siwa on the camera. Uh, there is already a guest on the program. I'm trying to get... Let me try again. Norma, I'm struggling to bring you on. Can you hold your phone in the right way that you are holding it? Is your network, and you think your network is the problem, because in, I, I can't hear you on my side.
I'll try again and see. It says, I can't bring Kudamu Sasi on camera. There's already a guest on this broadcast. I don't have a guest on this broadcast, so I can't understand why I can't bring Norma. Um, let me see if there's anybody in the meantime who can come. Melk. Uh, da, 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 da. Melk. Melk, can you ask to be added, please? Because I'm, I, can't, I can't seem to get that icon for me to add you. Uh, and when I click here, are you holding? In your phone landscape, Malk. Are you holding your your phone landscape? Approved. Malk, let's see if we can get you on. Can't bring Malk on camera. Is already a guest on the broadcast. I don't have a guest on the broadcast, but this thing is refusing for me to add anyone else. It says I've got a guest on the broadcast as I speak. There is no guest on the broadcast. This is when I say that technology sometimes sabotages me because I don't understand why I can't seem to add anybody. Uh, I'm struggling to add people here. I'm trying to add somebody else now. Let's see if that will work. It says I'm on a broadcast with somebody.